Yeah, I think I probably will have 15. I said I have 20 for this, so I don't know. Well, how, how long did your organizer give you? My organizer gave me 15. So okay. Do you want to give me? Yeah, we'll do 15. 15. And then we have five for discussion. Great. And will you give me a warning? I'll give you a two minute warning perfect. if I remember. <laughs> if I remember. <laughs> okay, perfect. Great. All right. Well, Here we go. It's great to see everybody. This is really nice. Um, so I am doing a paper that so those of you who had 275 with me will think is quite familiar, but hopefully vastly improved during the great span of time since then. Um, unsurprisingly, I'm focusing on demographic and health survey data and analyzing the quality of data related to the estimation of infant and child mortality. So um, I'm going to talk first about the context for DHS. We know that data quality are really important here, but it might have been compromised. Uh, I'm going to talk about the measure of data quality that I'm using for this placement, why we expect it to happen, why that matters, and how we measure it. I'm um, going to also then talk about assessing the impact of the questionnaire link, because I think that's really related to the data quality measure and the implications of my findings for um, infant and child mortality estimation. So most of you are probably familiar with the demographic and health surveys. Um, it's considered to be, we can all just tilt our heads. Right? Um, it's considered to be the gold standard for data quality, which may or may not be questionable. They're nationally representative household-based sample surveys. They've been conducted since 1984 in more than 90 countries. We now have more than 300 surveys. Um, Data from these surveys are used to estimate the fertility and infant and child mortality rates in the majority of low and, income, at low and middle income countries around the world. Any country that doesn't have a great vital registration system relies primarily on the DHS usually. Um, now the denominator for infant and child mortality rates is births that occurred in the five years before the survey. And for fertility rates, it's births that occurred in, well, the numerator is births that occurred in the three years prior to survey. So we know that reporting, uh, good reporting of recent births is really important. But we also know that there's been some evidence, especially from the report by Bruno Shoemaker recently, that found that recent births can be either displaced or omitted. Now here's how birth displacement happens. In the DHS questionnaire, at the top of a long section of, in the fertility um, maternity history is this skip pattern. So if the woman had one or more births in this year that's usually five years prior to the date of survey, this would be a fair survey that took place in 2006, she answers a long series of questions about each birth that took place since, since 2001. If she has not had any births since 2001, she gets skipped out of two entire sections of the questionnaire. So that's a bit of an incentive to, if she had a birth that was in maybe 2001, we're just going to push it back, especially if maybe she's a little uncertain about when that birth took place. And I'll show you some examples of what this looks like. Um, now, we, we know from experience that interviewers, the woman has asked about her births earlier in the questionnaire, but we know that interviewers pick this up and figure out pretty quickly, they're smart, they can figure out pretty quickly that we, if we, if we displace the birth, that the interview gets shorter. Uh, we also know that there's differential displacement of dead children. Now, this might seem kind of intuitive because a woman gets asked if you want to show fewer questions about her deceased child. She still gets asked if she received antenatal care and where she delivered the child. But we still find that um, there's differential displacement of dead children, which has a, a clear impact on the estimation of infant and child mortality. And my guess, this is just a hypothesis, but my guess is that the interviewer doesn't want to make this woman talk about experiences surrounding the death of her child, which kind of makes sense. So um, in terms of the DHS, we know that the core questionnaire has more than doubled since 1984, and that there have been not only increases in the length of the questionnaire, but also in complexity. DHS now in uh, suspected high HIV prevalence countries collects blood for HIV biomarkers. There's also uh, domestic violence, which requires a different informed consent procedure, the maternal mortality module. There's a whole lot of things that are being added on as DHS becomes more and more of a survey. And this is hypothesized to affect data quality in three different ways. One, field worker training. When you're training the interviewers, they need to cover a lengthier and more complex questionnaire. So there's less time spent per section of the questionnaire, especially the birth history and why it's so important not to displace the births. 
field work monitors, uh, the people who are responsible for checking the data quality, have less time to spend per each section of the questionnaire. They're trying to cover, you know, the, about the validity of the HIV testing and informed consent procedures and all of that that maybe they didn't need to cover in the past. And that we also think there's pretty severe interviewer fatigue, or interviewee fatigue. So the, the interviewer will try to join the questionnaire to make sure that the woman doesn't say, I'm sorry, I have to make dinner, you have to come. So my research question, given all of that, is does the increasing length and complexity of the survey instrument, of the questionnaire, lead to poor data quality and thus potentially biased inferential mortality estimates? And the way that I'm trying to assess this is by using the survey as the unit of analysis and examine survey level factors, particularly the length of the questionnaire and additional modules that might be associated with data quality. The outcome that I'm looking at is what we're calling the boundary ratio. So that's the ratio of births in the um, count of births in the boundary year divided by the number of births in the boundary year minus one. I'll show you an example of what this looks like graphically. And multiplying that by 100. So if there's an equal number of births, as you would expect unless fertility is dramatically changing, you would expect that to be about 100. So if there's a, if it's substantially below 100, that is a good indication of, of, um, of displacement. Now, again, if it's you know, 95 or 105, I'm not worried. If it's 70, we're worried. Um, I'm calculating this separately for living and, and dead children. And then we also care not only about the level of displacement, but also the ratio of deceased to living displacement. So if they're displaced equally, that doesn't really affect infant and child mortality. If dead kids are displaced way more, that really has an impact. So I'm basically just taking the ratio of two ratios, the ratio of the boundary ratio for deceased kids over living kids. And again, values much less than 100 indicate more severe displacement of dead kids. So here's what this looks like. So this is a survey conducted in Uganda in 2006. The boundary year was 2001. So any births since 2001, they had to ask these questions. Any births before that, they didn't have to, and unsurprisingly, we do see quite a bit of displacement. The purple line is all births, the green is surviving kids, and the blue is dead kids. And we see that the boundary ratios are well below 100, and the dead to surviving ratio is 72. Now, you may be thinking, okay, well, it's normal to have these births displaced into the year 2000, right? That's just, that's just normal keeping. Well, here's an example in which the boundary year is 2005. So we would actually expect to see, so when I say heaping, I mean, you know, it's pretty normal if a woman doesn't exactly remember the birth, the date of birth of her kid, to report it in five-year increments, report that he was born in 2005, he was born in 2000. Well, here we would expect to see more reporting of, of births in 2005. In fact, we see it in 2004, and there's no good reason that we would expect that to happen. And the boundary ratio here is pretty um, severe and also more worrying is we see this really sharp decline even in recent years of dead kids and we hope that child mortality is falling in Burkina Faso, but I don't think any of us think it's falling that fast. Um, just, to convince you, just to say that that's not always the case, we do have great surveys like in Jordan. This is exactly what we'd hope to expect in a country where fertility is relatively unchanging, that the number of births per year is flat, and the boundary ratios are all around 100. Unfortunately, Jordan is kind of a rare case, so these are the averages by region, and as we can see, um, the average ratios are well below 100, and they're especially, it's um, especially damning as the issues in West Africa. So that's where we have the, the worst boundary ratios. <laughs> so what I'm doing is I'm taking, I calculated these boundary ratios for every survey, um, every survey available. So that gives me a sample of 238 surveys in 82 countries. And I measured, so to try to get the complexity of the questionnaire, it's more difficult than I think to count the number of questions in a questionnaire. <laughs> because, believe me, I've tried. Um, because there's really complicated state patterns. So a woman who answers yes to one question gets asked this set of questions. A woman who answers no gets asked this set. So if you count them more nearly, you'll double count. There's also a lot of repeated sections in the questionnaire. For example, in maternal mortality, a woman answers the same set of questions for every sibling she has. So if you count them only once, you're not getting an accurate count. 
What I do instead is I count the number of non-empty variables in the survey and divide that by the number of women who responded. So I get an average count of the number of variables per survey, which is a reasonable approximation. Uh, there are some caveats, and I'm happy to discuss them. But for, for purposes of speed, I'm going to move on. And what that looks like, so I mentioned that the, that the question is increased in length, and we can definitely see that. So in the late 80s, we had two to 300 questions, roughly, in the questionnaire, uh, whereas here, whereas now, we have closer between six and 800. The good news, we have a little bit of curvilinear relationship happening here. It's going down a little bit in the more recent surveys, and that's because the DHS shortened the core questionnaire in the most recent time point. So I'm hopeful that we will see data quality coming back around. By the way, these two outliers were interim surveys, and they both have fantastic boundary ratios with really short questions. So to try to measure the association between the, the, the questionnaire and these boundary ratios on using the Poisson model, uh, my outcome variable are these boundary ratios. My key independent variable is the, the long number of variables in the survey. I include dummy variables for whether the survey contained uh, HIV biomarker testing, anemia testing, or other biomarkers. Um, I do dummy variables for the survey <coughs> region because we know that there's quite a lot of variation by region. Um, in case countries get better over time, if they have repeated surveys and they, their data quality improves, I try to capture that with the number of survey rounds within each country that also adjusts the clustering on country. Um, the percent of women with no education, we know it's much, uh, there's much higher displacement and poorer reporting of dates of birth among women with no education. And um, in some cases, we have births that don't have a recorded date of birth, and that gets imputed, and so I, I adjust for that as well. So here's what those models come out to look like. Here's the boundary ratio for all children. We can see that there is a negative association between the total between an increase in the total number of variables and the decrease in boundary ratios. We also see that that's negative and significant, especially in the sub-Saharan African countries. This also remains significant. There does seem to be a slight positive effect of having repeated surveys in the country. When we get to deceased children, the, um, the coefficient on the number of variables is much stronger, but the, so the regional effect disappears. Um, and I, I'll talk about that in just a minute. For surviving children, we get a um, pretty similar situation here, but the effect on the log number of variables disappears, but when we take the ratio, so looking at differential displacement of deceased children over surviving children, that they become significant once again. Now, I was really curious why the effect disappears here of, of region, and I also thought about Ken Wachter saying, well, it's significant, but is it meaningful? <laughs> so, like a good student of Ken's, I graphed it, and so this is on the linear scale, because I don't think of logs, I don't know. Um, this is the predicted boundary ratios for deceased kids from the model, so setting, up, setting all the other covariates to the mean at, for each region. And we can see why the coefficients aren't significant. The, the confidence intervals overlap pretty completely. But we can also see that for sub-Saharan Africa, which is the red line, I hope the colors are clear on here, it's substantially, the predicted boundary ratio is substantially lower at, for, for every um, combination of variables. So translating this into um, kind of the impact. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, the boundary ratio, even when the number of questions was really low, is, was 74. If we add 100 questions to get to 350, the boundary ratio becomes 70. So that there's 70 kids in the, in the boundary year for every 100 kids in the boundary year minus one. When we get to 550, kind of in the middle of the graph, that's 65. And at 800 questions, that boundary ratio is 58, which doesn't say great things about the estimates of infant child mortality. So my conclusions, and hopefully I'm on time. Um, one minute. One minute. Perfect. OK. Uh, we do see evidence of displacement in many, actually in the vast majority of DHS surveys. Displacement does look to be worst in Sub-Saharan and especially in Western Africa, um, which casts some doubt on recent estimates of decreases in infant child mortality. And uh, Bernice Maker's work has also cast doubt on the changes in fertility patterns. 
Um, this isn't a causal analysis, but it does, I think, hopefully provide pretty strong evidence that data quality does decrease as questionnaire length increases. Now here's the good news. So that was the bad news. Here's the good news. So this is, these are the boundary ratios by DHS phase. So earlier DHSs have higher boundary ratios than they got lower. And here's the good news is that in the most recent DHS surveys, we have higher boundary ratios again. So, and that's when, this is in phase six is when they cut the length of the core questionnaire. So because they've already, they've already reduced the length of the core questionnaire, I'm hoping that the data quality is on the upswing. Um, because these, these, the reasons for this displ displacement, at least in large part, if they're due to the length of the core questionnaire are known, that can be remedied by doing a not fun job of cutting the core questionnaire. Um, in terms of other improvements that can be done, one thing, if you have a large enough sample, you don't have to use the full five years um, of recent history for the mortality estimation. You can use a shorter time period. Mm -hmm. And the uh, folks in the UN group at child, that you can see the results of child mortality work, that work have been doing stuff like that. Um, and the questionnaire, you could do something like force interviewers to ask about your, most, your two most recent births, no matter how long ago they occurred. I propose that. I don't think it's going to happen, but it's still an okay. So. Thank you. One minute over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a couple of questions. So write down your questions, everyone. Do you want to elaborate? I'm curious if uh, the number of questions that you're using as a predictor is influenced by the boundary ratio, since presumably boundary ratios that reduce the number of questions. Um, right, you, you want to make the interview shorter and thus you skip right. some questions, which mm -hmm. then would presumably show up. Absolutely. Like, it is like endogenous, yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have some sort of mechanical relationship between those two variables that are sort of not accounted for. Good question. I did think about that. It is slightly endogenous, so if there's more displacement, you get the, you get a smaller average number of variables. Um, I couldn't think of any way to get around it. And if somebody can, I'd be, I'd be thrilled to hear it. But I agree that is an issue. Carl? Are <coughs> interviewers paid per interview? No. That would make finding the solution really easy. <laughs> <laughs> or, or per question. Yeah. No. No, it's not that, unfortunately not that simple. Allison and Josh? Yeah, have you thought of the within survey analysis? Because I'm wondering if interviewers over time realize that if they shorten, then it's better. So mm -hmm. like in the beginning of the survey period, maybe you don't have this boundary issue, and then as time goes on, mm -hmm. you do. I would, I would suspect that that is probably true. It, it's, it's difficult to detect this displacement unless you have a large number of cases, yeah. but I'm also thinking even if that is true, what's the implication? Right? Well, just that in, in the, you can do some monitoring, real-time monitoring. Do. And, okay. We do. We yeah. do real-time monitoring. It is, they're checked as they come in from the field and they get gets reported back, but it's, yeah. it's, you need or, a substantial number of births to be able to detect it. Right. Or a follow-up would be if some interviewers are worse than others. Yeah. 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 So that's a good point. Yeah. Josh and then Laura? So I, I have uh, two suggestions, questions. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, I think for the analyst, we want to know how much does this affect our estimates? So if there's some even rough way to tell us that in the conclusion, mm -hmm. that would be very nice. And then the related question is, is there, uh, can we, is there some simple approach that one can take and move the births around from your graphs that would get us the right estimate? Uh, I think all your suggestions are in a line of, have big implications for the survey organization. <laughs> but if, if you could give some suggestions, the analyst like for three years, that would be great. So maybe mm -hmm. this is not something you do for PAA, but for, for the world, it would be great. Yeah, so um, I do get into that in the paper. Um, I did try to look at that, but the simulation, so I mean, basically what, so Tom Pullum and Stan Becker did a paper recently where they simulated moving the births back so that you get a smooth distribution of births. And they found that um, a, a displacement of about 3% means about a 12% uh, 
dip, uh, level of displacement of the, of the mortality rate um, underestimation in the most recent zero to five year period and overestimation in the five to nine year period. And that would be something we could put in at the end. Yeah, tell us. okay, so I, I, if, that's, if that's helpful, I don't Or even at the beginning. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 this is a big, this is a big yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Because um, so we don't know the place. Right? Yeah. We right. know yeah, mortality. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, yeah. so two um, styles. One is in the when you mentioned at the very beginning, it's about birth displacement. My thought was birth displacement. So I'm going to say quickly, I'm going to talk about what this is. Okay. It's really about this is really the story of the paper. Um, and then in the graph where you have that last graph where you have the the lines go down and it's hard to tell which is which. So one is. Uh, they were all with circles. Yeah, it's changed the markers. Shapes. And another is to think about dotted versus, you know, dash or whatever. Perfect. Just as a help, because as you can see, the colors weren't great. Yeah, they looked great on my screen. But I think we do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then in the interviewer fast thing, so one is by looking at the earlier people, I guess you can also identify who later on is actually the cause of it. Mm -hmm. I know in the GSS it was actually one person, one interviewer who actually caused, introduced a huge amount of error mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. um, and also by looking at the earlier interviews, you can get a better sense of how much displacement is actually, how to do better estimates if you know before the displacement is really in huge effect, you would have a better so idea. In the interest of, of realism for PA, I'm going to cut you off okay. here. <laughs> Those questions have been asked, they're not going to be answered, and we'll go on to our next speaker. So write down your questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. You can come here.